please remember to like, subscribe, or click the little notification bell if you don't want to miss out on these videos. And I'd just like to say thank you to all our patrons for making this possible. Please join them if you can. Well, thank you there, Steve. So we're going to bring on, I know it's getting late in the afternoon. You've all been sitting out there getting quietly cooked all afternoon. I can tell you now it's worth the wait. These are going to be some big beasts driving around now for you uh, if the army wasn't good enough. Um, Cold War, we always think of 1945 onwards, perhaps to the end of the Berlin Wall coming down. Maybe we're in a new Cold War era we might think of today. Why is it a Cold War? Because it's not a hot war. We didn't actually get to fighting. Uh, on the whole. Certainly in Europe, there were proxy wars all around Middle East, Far East, wars were fought. But a lot of military equipment that we see today is a hangover from the Cold War. Um, tanks that are being sold on, upgraded, they were originally designed for that potential battle between East and West. The Warsaw Pact countries, led by the Soviet Union against mainly, we thought, of NATO countries, uh, Britain, America, most of the Western Europe uh, were part of NATO. So again, that idea that when we look at vehicles today, we do teaching here. We have young engineers. Why do vehicles look like they do? Because a lot of them are still thinking of that idea of the type of battle that the Cold War might have brought, i.e. we knew the enemy, where they were coming from, we knew what they got, and we knew it was going to be one hell of a slug um, in terms of the fighting. Um, so in the West, with NATO countries, we tended to go for very well-trained troops, professional armies on the whole, and we went for sophisticated equipment. On the Soviet side, they went for good equipment, no two ways about it, but they went for mass numbers, huge numbers when you compare some of the vehicle fleets, uh, certainly compared to today. T-54 tank, the tank the uh, Russians started designing at the end of World War II, goes into production, uh, now probably the most made tank of all time. They're looking at figures up to 70, 80,000. Many of those T-54 tanks amazingly still work um, because they were so simple they could either be repaired or they were so crude there was so little to go wrong in the first place. Now we're going to start off by showing you some Cold War vehicles. Uh, one of those British design classics from just after the end of the Second World War we saw the Dingo earlier. This is the successor vehicle, also made by Alvis and Daimler. This is called the Ferret. Now, the Mark I Ferret didn't have a turret on the top. Again, good spatial awareness. You could look all around. This is the Mark II with a turret on, and you can see it's got what they call a GPMG, general purpose machine gun in the top there. Uh, early days, it had a, a .30 Browning machine gun. The best weapon on this vehicle was not that machine gun, it's a radio. Your role in this vehicle was going out, reporting back what you were seeing, where the enemy were, what was going on. If you bump into the enemy, quick burst of machine gun fire and you back out quick. And they gave the Ferret five reverse gears as well as five forward gears, just like the Dingo in World War II. So you could go just as fast backwards, nice and quickly, get yourself out of trouble. Now this particular one is in what they call the Berlin Urban Camouflage Scheme. Again, you go back to British forces based in Berlin, in essence behind the, uh, uh, the East German border, behind the front line. They realise there's no point painting their tanks green. So the commanding officer there came up with this block pattern that breaks up the outline of the vehicle, think dazzle ships in World War I, and it works really well in urban settings. And not that long ago, the British Army has actually painted some challengers in this urban camo, because urban is going to be the way of the future as well. So the ferret, very successful, sold all around the world. Uh, the Jordanians, even fairly recently, they were looking at putting new diesel engines in the back, upgrading them. Um, a number of police forces in America have ended up buying ex-British Army ferrets, and they give them to their SWAT teams. Um, so if someone's holed up in a building, a garage somewhere, some nutter gets in one of these and smashes down the front door um, to, so that the, uh, the weapons teams can enter. Now, at the same time as you doing secretive type of reconnaissance, you can do it another way. And you might want a vehicle like the Saladin. Talked about it earlier, the idea you might have to fight for the information. Or in the old days, they sometimes described it as kicking the ante. 
In other words, let's wake up the enemy, make them reveal their positions. And to do that, you might need more firepower. So the Saladin, again, comes into service. It's actually designed in the early 1950s. It's got a partner vehicle, the Saracen Armoured Personnel Carrier. The Malayan campaign was on at the time. They actually pushed the APC version forward quicker because they thought they needed it more. But the Saladin, it's a wonderful armoured car. What you've got there, six wheels. So if you lose one by going over a mine, you can still, the likelihood is you can still keep going. You've got a B80 Rolls-Royce petrol engine in the back to give it a bit of oomph. And in that turret is a medium velocity 76 millimeter gun. So about the same size gun as was on the Sherman in World War II, it can fire a range of ammunition types. So you can fire high explosive squash heads if you want to take on a tank. You'd be brave to take on a tank, but you could do it. It can fire things like uh, canister rounds, smoke rounds, um, a, you know, real good range of ammunition types there. Very popular vehicle, still in service with a number of countries, uh, certainly in Africa. Now, a number of vehicles uh, get sold around the world or licenses to build vehicles in other countries. This underneath all this vehicle, this particular one's called a Cougar, but underneath it is actually a vehicle that was designed originally in Switzerland by Moag. They call it the Piranha. They sold the licenses all around the world. This particular version built by General Dynamics of Canada, and it went into service with the Canadian Defence Forces, along with uh, uh, an armoured personnel version, the Grizzly, um, and a recovery version as well. What they do on this, with the Piranha, you can buy a six-wheeled version or an eight-wheeled version. It's like one of these multi-role vehicles. What are you going to need it for? We'll sell it to you. And in this version, the Canadians take the Scorpion turret and they drop, so the old Action Man tank, they drop the Scorpion turret on the top and they call it a fire support vehicle. So this would end up, it never saw actual combat action, um, but it ends up being very mobile, very fast, like these other wheeled vehicles. But again, just like that Saladin, it packs a bit of a punch with that size gun on it. Um, out of service now, they have sold some of them on to other countries. The Canadians, very kindly, they gave us one when they got rid of them. So we're very grateful there. Now, another type of vehicle coming on now, we've seen armoured personnel carriers. We've seen those half tracks from World War II, the 251, the German half track. We've seen the American, the M16 half-track. And this is what Britain comes up with in the 1960s. It's called the FV-432. They start making the 432 in 1962. And they're actually, some of them are still in service today. So if you work that one out, we're looking at a vehicle there um, that's about 60 years old, still in British Army service. Um, now they've had upgrades, of course, new engines, new braking systems. And as we were talking earlier, like many vehicles nowadays, if that vehicle was down here at training, it would look like this. When it goes off to fight, that's when they bolt all the extra armor and the extra stuff around the edges. So they're, they're hard to tell what they are nowadays so many vehicles because they have got so many things on the outside. The idea of 432, section of infantry in the back, facing inwards. Again, as we talked about earlier, it's to deliver the infantry where they're needed on the battlefield, mechanized infantry, keep up with the tanks. Tanks and infantry need to work together. That phrase, combined arms, air power, artillery, you need to work them together. On their own, they can be very vulnerable, Together, that's some force multiplier, this phrase they use. It means more when they're together. So there's the 432. Amazingly, some of them still in service to this day. Really, it's an APC of the 1960s, 1970s. Warrior mainly replaced it as the APC role in the 19, late 1980s, early 90s. Now this is another guest vehicle. You may have seen it earlier on. This is the AMX-13, a French vehicle built just after the Second World War.
So the French military have to re-establish their arms industry. They've been doing some secret work. Uh, one of their armoured cars they designed in 1939, they hid from the Germans uh, and they start the programme going again. We've got one of those armoured cars, Panhard, over in our vehicle conservation centre. This vehicle, the French paratroopers says we're going to have to have something that can take on tanks. But just like Britain, France has still got a bit of an empire. They're going to have to make it air portable. So AMX, the company, comes up with AMX 12, 12 tonne vehicle. It ends up increasing in weight, hence AMX 13. It's a 13 tonne light vehicle. They start with a 75 millimetre gun. The French copy the gun that was on the German Panther tank. And they put that on a number of vehicles. They start that on the AMX, they then go up to a 90 millimeter. This one, amazingly, has got a 105 millimeter gun on it. We'll look at that 105 gun with another tank in a moment. But it's in what they call an oscillating turret. The top of the turret goes up and down with the gun. It's pinned at one place, so it uh, goes up and down that way. It means they can strap another auto loader to the roof, six rounds on either side of the gun, it can fire through those rounds, armor piercing or high explosive, but then you've got to go and disappear off to reload. Um, so only 12 rounds before you need reloading. And again, it was sold many countries, relatively cheap, many countries took it into service, many upgrades over time. Um, the Israelis used it. If they went up as they did in 1967, they fought other tanks with AMX-13s, they immediately took them out of service because quite frankly they were useless um, because you hadn't got the level of protection that were needed. If you're fighting people without tanks, no worries. Now in 1943 in Britain, uh, we know about the Panther tank. The Russians capture ones, they send one to Britain, captured at the Battle of Kursk. They send the measurements and uh, the plans. We know we need a, a better cruiser tank. So they put out the uh, requirement for a heavy cruiser and that ends up being developed into the Centurion tank. It doesn't see action in World War II. It's rushed out to Germany in May of 1945 misses the end of the war by a few weeks, but it becomes probably the best post-war tank for at least 10, probably 20 years. Um, it's a very good basic overall design. They've got that power plant now, that fa fa fabulous Merlin engine, derated, now called the Meteor, 680 horsepower, so it's got some welly. They decide to get rid of a bow machine gun position. Let's have a nice flat frontal glacé plate for protection, like the Panther seems to have. And again, they put originally the 17-pounder gun on it, great, great tank-killing gun, then the 20-pounder gun, that's the gun that they see action with this tank in Korea. And then, because we capture, or actually we get to look at, a Soviet T-54 tank, 1956, driven inside the British Embassy in the Hungarian Uprising, we get to measure it. The defence attaché sees the thickness of the armour, measures the 100 millimetre gun, and it frightens the West. So very quickly we decide we're going to need a much better, bigger gun. Royal Ordnance do some work. They come up with something called the L7 105 millimetre gun. And that's what, in the end of the 1950s, they start putting on the Centurion. And that gun is a world beater. It makes tanks like the Conqueror redundant. This can fire a discarding Sabo round that will penetrate pretty much any Russian tank. So that idea of the Centurion, the fact you could upgrade it, meant it stayed in service for a long time. Now, 
Now, many countries that bought or used the Centurion, when the time came to replace the Centurion, like this one is uh, a Canadian leopard here driving around, the Canadians had Centurions. When time came to replace them, they went for this tank, the Leopard 1. The German, the German military is reformed in 1955. America supplies tanks, they buy vehicles from around the world, but they start their own design programs. And for the Germans in the post-war era, they said speed and firepower is way more important than armor protection. End of the war, we see those big heavy German tanks like the Tiger, the King Tiger, etc. They forget all that. They go, no, we want mobility, speed on the battlefields, what's gonna make us survive? And that's why the Leopard 1 is so fast, relatively thin armor, but they got that British gun, that's a 105 millimeter gun, so superb firepower. And this particular Leopard 1, as I mentioned, it's got the maple leaf you can see on the side of the turret, used by the Canadian military. And I always like telling this story, the Canadians took their leopards out of service in the early 2000s. We said, could we have one? They gave us two, really lovely. Then they went to fight in Afghanistan, realized they dropped a big one and had to buy leopard tanks back from the Germans because if you haven't got a tank, you start realizing very quickly you need a tank. The Tank Museum is a registered charity and every purchase you make from our online shop directly supports our work. We ship worldwide and if you subscribe to our email list, we'll give you 10% off your next order. When you finish this video, go to tankmuseumshop.org and you'll find something you never knew you needed. Now the Soviets on the other side, as it were, Soviets are supplying tanks to the Warsaw Pact, all those other satellite countries. The Soviet tank design is evolutionary. They tend to put a bigger gun, better armor, probably the same engine so often on their vehicles, these frying pan shaped turrets. And this particular tank, it's not actually a Russian tank. It's a Russian design that was handed over when China and Russia were pals at the beginning of the 1950s. Uh, Russia said it would build a tank industry for the Chinese. So originally, these tanks were put together with Russian-made parts. Ultimately, the Chinese manufacture the whole tank themselves. Now, this tank is called a Type 59. So Type tanks are Chinese copies of earlier Russian tanks. So it's a Chinese copy of a Type 50 or a T-54 tank. And later the Russians and the Chinese fall out. They have a border skirmish. The Chinese capture a later Russian tank, take it on and they copy that tank. And they make that a Type 69 tank um, because it's more modern in the design process. What you've got there, this particular one, even more confusing, that British L7 gun I told you about, it was touted around the world for sale. If you bought yourself a type tank, you could now buy an upgrade. And this has actually got the British gun on it, the L7 gun as an upgrade done by Royal Ordnance. Um, so you could upgrade your tank. So what you're looking at there to confuse you even more. So it's a Chinese copy of a Russian tank with a British gun on. Um, and it's even got British smoke discharges as well. China sold these tanks all around the world. Uh, and their instructions, they realized, don't put them in Chinese, the instructions inside that tank are in English because they recognize most people will be able to read English wherever they sold them to. Now the Americans World War II, the end of the Second World War, they're starting to get their Pershing tanks to Europe and that begins a family of tanks that really they then call the Patton family, M47, M48. They're evolutionary design. Like the Russians, they look similar, they just get bigger. 
each time. And this in the family is the last one built, the M60. And uh, as you look at it driving around, whopping great cast hull, cast turret, that yet again, that British L7, 105 millimeter gun, best gun going, so they're gonna use it. Uh, the Americans actually put it on their first Abrams tanks as well, that 105 millimeter gun. And uh, it just gets bigger. It's a huge, great tank, continental diesel engine in the back of it, last generation, of a big heavy tank made with cast armour. The next generation is going to have laminates, layers of material that offer better protection for the weight involved. Now this M60, you can see on the top, the Commander's almost got a mini turret. That's got a 50 calibre machine gun in, but it also means he can turn that turret and look for targets whilst the gunner is actually firing at an original target. So this hunter-killer system, look for the enemy, look for what you need to fire at, whilst actually the killer bit is the gunner who's actually picking off those targets in due course. And on this one, it's got a white light, a search light above the barrel for night firing. Uh, again, uh, before infrared comes in, you can see there's an infrared uh, light on top of that Centurion tank. The trouble with infrared is when you turn it on, it can be detected so they'll know you're there. Uh, thermal imaging can't be detected. That's where they're taking the light and actually improving the light inside the vehicle. Um, infrared, it's basically pumping out a ray that can be detected, so there's problems there. Now, unfortunately at the moment, we don't actually have a running chieftain. We've got a trouble, but we thought it'd be wrong not to let you hear down the end there. That noise is actually the chieftain L60 engine but this is in a Chieftain recovery vehicle, the Chieftain ARV. Um, and that vehicle there, again, we saw it with the Challenger recovery vehicle earlier. If you're gonna recover a tank on the battlefield, you need a good winch, you need holly bones, those metal bars that they can attach to another vehicle, um, and also carrying spare engines. What they don't tend to do with uh, tanks, instead of trying to fix the engine, great if it's something simple, but it's an engine or a pack lift, out comes a whole engine, in goes a whole new one, and hopefully within a couple of hours off you go again. And the speed of that engine change is obviously very important to the military, so they practice that, they get good at it. Dozer blade on the front, front to anchor you into the ground. high ab crane on the back and that odd looking structure on the rear is to mount an engine on so they can lift that spare pack off the back of the vehicle. They could also tow a whopping great trailer that could take a couple of spare engines in the back as well. So uh, mainly crewed by Remy, Royal Electrical Mechanical Engineers, um, who are taking, who are basically trying to keep as many of the vehicle fleet going as possible so you've got enough vehicles for the following day's battle. Really important. Again, same in World War II, keeping vehicles back into service, um, which is, uh, uh, you know, so that the vehicle numbers, the fleet size is kept up. Now, we've got a bit of an oddity here. It's built during the Cold War, but it wasn't aligned. It didn't, again, Sweden, Switzerland, non-aligned countries. They weren't necessarily going to say, we're gonna fight with NATO but they were certainly worried about the Russians. So again, in this particular case with Sweden, they come to Britain to say, can we buy Centurion tanks? At the time, originally, we were fighting in Korea. We didn't have enough spare. So they start their own tank programs. And this particular vehicle, this is what they call a tank destroyer. So they start making that famous wedge of cheese, the S tank. This particular one is called the IKV-91 and it's built with the Swedish countryside in mind. It's got heaters for the engine. Sweden gets very cold in the winter. It's amphibious because there's lots of lakes. This can actually go across the water quite easily with very little preparation. And in this case, they actually put a 90 millimeter low pressure gun on it 
that can fire one of these rounds, hollow charge or squash heads that can penetrate armour, not by the sheer kinetic energy, but what they call chemical energy. It ends up blowing up a cone of hot liquid jetting forward, that's hollow charge, or the Hesh round, high explosive squash head, pancakes on the side of another tank, detonates, sends a shock wave through the armour plate, and a spool or bits come off on the inside and do a lot of damage. So you don't always have to have a high velocity gun to knock out tanks. Now the IKV-91 uh, was in service only in uh, Sweden. It wasn't sold anywhere else. But again, you can see that very distinctive Swedish camouflage pattern on it as well. Um, again, used specifically for those northern climates and the type of landscape Sweden was going to have to uh, fight in. Now another country, neutral, Switzerland, again wanted to buy Centurions from Britain. Again, they have to start their own tank program waiting for our tanks. So this is what the Swiss come up with. It's called the PZ-61. So Switzerland has already built some tanks, they're uh, Czech tanks, they build them under license. Um, but this is their first really indigenous design. And again, thinking of Switzerland, narrow roads, mountainous, they make the tank narrower than normal tanks. They give it very fine driving controls because if you see some of those tanks driving around earlier, they've got a pretty wide arc when they try and turn. This thing, they couldn't risk that on a mountain road and have the driver go off the edge. Um, so it's got a very sophisticated steering system so it can traverse those narrow roadways safely. And what do they do? They get the gun from Britain again. So yet again, here we go, that's the L705 millimetre gun. The only thing, they build it under licence in Switzerland, the only thing they have to import is the engine. And basically they went for a Mercedes bus engine because again, very sensibly, they knew that Mercedes bus engines used all around the world, they'd be able to buy spare parts from someone. So the Swiss, again, neutral country, big armed force, lots of defense companies based there, um, because again, we were saying earlier, there's no point in saying you're neutral if you don't have an army, because then you become irrelevant. You've got to be able to defend your neutrality. So I mentioned that the Soviets tend to build tanks evolutionary. T-54, T-55, then the T-62. A bit of a revolutionary tank was the T-64. Now we haven't got one here at Bobbington, we're trying to get one. Uh, new type of engine, very different design, had problems. And even though we think of Russia as this monolithic country um, under the communist era, actually there was big rivalries in Russia at the time. Alexander Morozov, who designs the T-64, there's another rival tank factory. Even though he's got pals in the Kremlin, this other tank factory says, listen, you're having problems with the T-64. Let us design a simpler version. And originally, that tank becomes the T-72. It was only going to be built if Russia went to war. But through some clever fiddle, the factory ended up getting permission to start building them and they go into war production. In other words, they start mass producing the T-72. And that's what we're seeing driving around at the moment. It's an attack tank. It's low. It's fast. It's got a 125 millimeter gun. Um, it can fire not only those metal darts to smash through armor. It's a smoothbore gun. It's like a tube. So they could use it to launch missiles as well that could go out much farther than a normal tank round could go and they get rid of the loader in that tank 
in, uh, and they put an auto loader in and that means you can make it lower. The guy doesn't have to stand up to load the rounds in. Very effective vehicle, again, sold on around the world. This one was captured in the Middle East uh, and you can see still very impressive looking bit of kit. In Britain, we were designing a tank to replace the Chieftain. That was going to be something called MBT-80. Again, with so many of these tank projects, it went awry. They did some very clever technology. It became more and more expensive. At the same time, the Shah of Iran was having three tanks built in Britain. One of them, a very modern tank called Shia-2. And when the Shah was deposed, and the new Iranian government said, no, we don't want any of that now, thank you. The British Army took over the project. So FE4030-2 becomes Challenger 1. That's the tank going around now. So it was taken into service with the British Army, few fiddles around the edges, but it wasn't quite the tank the Army wanted. Now Challenger 1 actually saw sterling service, it gets to fight in the first Gulf War. It actually has the record for the longest tank on tank kill uh, that's ever been done. Um, but Vickers in the background realised it wasn't the tank the army wanted. They used pretty much the Challenger hull, but they come up with a new turret and new technology that had been on the MBT-80. And that becomes Challenger 2 that you see a little bit earlier on with the British Army today. Now our Challenger 1 has got its gun reversed. In the Cold War, you didn't put your gun forward unless you knew that meant the enemy knew you meant business. So when they leave most of the training bases, gun over the rear engine decks unless you're being threatening. I mentioned how these Cold War vehicles, they still influence what's going on fighting around the world. Those T-72s, Russian made about uh, 25,000 of them. They were actually manufactured under license elsewhere as well. Some were made in the Middle East. Um, they're still in service all over the place because they're a simple tank, relatively cheap, and you can upgrade them. So you can spend money on getting new things to add to the vehicle to make it more threatening. And that's what's going on around the world. Lots of upgrades on vehicles. So it's almost hard keeping up with what's underneath. The new armor packages, the new defensive aid suites, electronic or uh, hard kill countermeasures. Some of these things can fire things out um, at incoming rounds to disrupt them or to actually take them down. Um, so many new things you can buy off the shelf to add to your tank fleet. That's why tanks like the T-72 are going to be in service probably for decades to come um, because you can get hold of them. Uh, a lot of them, there wasn't that t long ago, we actually found a whole running T-72 tank with a live gun for sale for 30,000 euros. Peanuts in tank terms. Um, you know, many of you got cars here worth much more than that. So a lot of them were rebought. They've seen service in Syria. Price has gone up. You can't buy a, a tank like that now. Uh, well, quarter of a million was the last one we saw going. Now, we're going to try and get these vehicles off for you in what we uh, sometimes call a bit of a carousel. So you'll see these things driving around in a little bit of a circle as we uh, get them to go and park up, ready for our last little battle at the end of the afternoon. <laughs> 